who am I? This probably sounds like the kind of question that you might ask while lying on your psychiatrist's couch. Actually, though, it's a timeless question. When I ask, who am I, I'm really asking, what is my circle? And the very next question that follows from this is, are you inside my circle or outside it? Now, your answer says a lot about whether you may have a lot of enemies or whether you're likely to live peaceably with friends. Putting the question another way, who is us and who is them? Now, I happen to come from a WASP background in the United States, so as I grew up, I was perhaps initially a little less attuned to perhaps questions of minority peoples, cultures, and languages. But when I became a teenager, I became fascinated with other cultures. I wanted to travel, live overseas, learn languages. And my job later on, I was an intelligence officer, took me and my family to live overseas in many different places over a considerable period of time. And then multiculturalism entered our own family. Apart from our two biological daughters, my wife and I adopted a one-year-old Korean orphan. Now, we watched as he dealt with this question of identity and belonging over the years, living with us all the while in very different places all around the world. Luke sadly died of a drug overdose at age 21. These things, sadly, happen to many people. I ended up writing a memoir about this, but our time with him made us even more personally sensitive to questions of identity in daily life, where we belong. Although I certainly wouldn't want to suggest that identity issues have to lead to despair or to drugs. But the question is still there for most of us. We all have friends, family, who might be from minority backgrounds or different than we are. But let's go back to the beginning. Did cavemen, cavemen sit around their fireplace and worry about this question of identity? Well, yes, in a sense, they did. They didn't talk to psychiatrists about it, no. But they certainly knew who belonged and who didn't. Was the next cave, for example, friendly? And did it belong? Or what about the next five or ten caves away? How far did you have to go to find un unfriendly caves? And why were they unfriendly? Yeah, back then, we might have fought over who got what portion of a mastodon that we had just hunted. But even then, there were those who were, we were willing to work with peaceably, and others we viewed flat out as enemies who we couldn't get along with. So the question of who do we belong to becomes very fundamental. You know, it's interesting that among many aboriginal peoples with very ancient cultures like Navajo in the American Southwest or Kwakutl in, uh, in Northwestern Canada, and for these people, the word for their own peoples is simply the people. Now, if you weren't one of the people, you were obviously something else and possibly something even threatening. That makes, again, who am I a very important question. So who do we include then, and who do we exclude from our group? I'm not just talking about our own communities. This is actually a global issue. And so let me get a little more specific for clarity's sake. Let's take the case of Iraq, by now, sadly familiar to all of us through watching events over the years on the, on the TV screen. The country has suffered terribly in the last two decades and is still undergoing serious identity crises and struggles. But you know, when we use the word identity, this isn't just one thing, it's a, it's a complicated thing. 
In reality, we all have multiple identities. Gender, for example, is one of the most basic ones in our everyday lives. And then there's ethnic difference. What ethnic group do we belong to? Many of us are increasingly ethnically mixed. And then there's linguistic. You might belong to one language or ethnic group, but end up speaking another language. And then there's regional. What region do you come from? And how much do people from that region have a strong sense of belonging against others on the outside? Think Texas. Think of northern versus southern China, or even northern versus southern Italy. And then there's religion. In the Middle East, for several thousands of years, people organized their communities on religious bases rather than on ethnic or linguistic bases. Now, in principle, one system can work just as well as the other. It's all about how tolerant you are within that particular system. And then there's political identity. <clears throat> in America, are you a Democrat or a Republican? or these days, red or blue? In the UK, are you a Tory or a socialist or something else? Do you identify personally as a liberal or conservative globally? And then we even have professional identity at our class. Are you from more from a blue-collar class, to use an old-fashioned term? Or are you white-collar? Are you university-educated? For Karl Marx, class was the ultimate mean, meaningful identity issue. And even music and culture, what cultural tribe do you belong to? If you're my age, did you get off on Grateful Dead? Or today, do you go to Radiohead concerts? And what sports tribe do you belong to? In some countries, that question can lead to street riots. Now, some of these identity elements we can easily change. We can change what team we root for. We can change our musical taste. We can seek higher education. We can change our profession. We can move from one part of the country to another, even immigrate to another country. But it's harder to change our ethnicity. And skin color and facial appearance are with us forever. And then comes the harshest aspect of this identity question of all. Because our, our identity, it isn't just what we think we are. We can decide who we are, and we can cling to that identity. But unfortunately, it's a two-way street. I, I may th think I know who I am, but you may think I'm a different person. You may see me in a different light, and that those two views may not agree. For example, sadly, some Americans argue now about who is a real American, and that causes real trouble. And sometimes questions like this can cause even life or death consequences. For example, a terrible genocide took place in Rwanda in 1994 between Hutu and Tutsi people. Yet the differences between the Tutu and the Tutsi were in ethnic or linguistic or even religious terms were really rather slight. So who was us and who was them at that time? And one million people ended up being slaughtered as a result. Or take Iraq. I may say, I'm Iraqi. But another Iraqi may say, no, you're a Kurd even if I'm an Iraqi citizen. Yet another Iraqi may focus on whether I'm Shiite or Sunni. For them, that is the most important designation, not what my passport says. Or take the tragic case of Nazi Germany. Look how quickly here situations can change. In 1922, if we had asked a German Jew on the street, who are you? And remember, in 1992, we're talking about the German Weimar Republic, Democratic, Liberal. If we were to ask that Jew on the street in 1922, who are you? He or she might have answered, 
well, I'm a German, I'm a Berliner, I teach at the Freie Universität, uh, I'm a Jew, I'm a professor of psychology, I grew up in Heidelberg, uh, I'm a socialist, I'm a serious tennis player, and I play oboe in our local symphony. Now, let's take that same person 15 years later, when Hitler's Nazi party had come to full power. If you ask that person then, who are you? There was only one answer that meant anything to the authorities. The Jewish identity was all that mattered, and that usually had fatal consequences. Same country, same people, different circumstances. I wrote a book some years back on Arab Shiites, along with an Iraqi American woman, whose father happened to be Shiite, and her mother was Sunni. This was commonplace in the Iraq in the 1950s. But after the chaos following the US invasion of Iraq in 2003, the place fell apart. A mixed marriage like that then really became unthinkable. Indeed, mixed neighborhoods became unthinkable. So your sectarian identity often for you came to mean life or death and others imposed that on you. For many black people, the question of color may be at the top of their identity concerns, but it's not because they want it to be. Among themselves, it isn't the key criterion, but for some other people, color is a key issue. And this isn't only about prejudice, we're also talking about power. So there it is, we can't always control what we claim our identity is if others don't see it that way. But what's striking in all of this is how fast these identity issues can get right down to the ugly gut level. And times of crisis are what throws this all right out on the table, out on the floor in front of us. When things go bad, political or social, unheaval, upheaval, revolution, war, riots, anything that destroys the formerly established order, then identity becomes deeply fundamental. When things go bad like this, you find who, what your gut identity is. Have you ever wondered why we hear so much about tribalism or clans or sectarian groups right now in Iraq? It's because the government and the infrastructure and the social order were destroyed. Society then turns into a jungle of survival. And at that point, your identity becomes totally focused on your own personal security and the security of your family. Why wouldn't it? Where, where do you go in times of deep trouble like this? Who, who will take you in? Who will acknowledge you as one of their own? Who will protect you, feed you, give you a gun? Fight for your cause. It can get pretty raw and fundamental. And at that point, 